She never uses force. She uses her wits and her magic. And sometimes she outsmarts herself. Raven is often good, sometimes bad. Raven is always beautiful. Above all else, Raven loves beautiful things, especially bright, shiny things. One day, Raven heard the people talking about an old fisherwoman and her daughter who lived on an island far to the north and had a round, bright, shiny thing that they called moon, which they kept in a beautiful carved cedar box, locked away from those who might want to steal it. Raven wanted the moon. When I first started collecting stories, I made a point of not taking tape recorder, not only because many of the places that I went didn't have electricity to run it, and I never believed that they were giving the stories to me. They were sharing them, but they, that didn't make them my stories. They belong to the people who tell them. They belong to the people who've guarded them for thousands of years. And, and at first I did nothing with the stories other than be very glad that I had heard them and try to incorporate them into my own life because there's an incredible amount of, of really wonderful living skills in, in those stories. And then people started telling me that they were giving me the story. And the Indians have a thing that, that was much more effective than copyright law that had to do with respecting other people's works. And when they gave me the story, that meant that I could use it, I could tell it, I could write it, I could incorporate it into my work. And then a couple of years ago, I was told that some of the women wanted a book to be written, and they told me what they wanted to be in the book. I've been really fortunate that I've met a lot of very old women not all of whom were native, who were just so glad that someone would hear what they had to say. I think it's really a shame that so few people are listening. And one of the beautiful things about the oral tradition of the West Coast people is that you are supposed to listen to what is being said and you are supposed to feel what is being said. You're not supposed to just record it and think that's it forever and ever. Amen. And there are some people now who object to the fact that a non-Indian is telling Indian stories. My answer to that is, where were you before these old women died? Why weren't you listening to them? Why did it have to be me? And the funny thing is that the people who shared the stories, the storytellers, never, never cared that I was milk-faced. They were not racist. She tickled the baby's toes. She smiled, she sang, she tried everything that she knew. And that baby cried. Oh, for heaven's sake, the old fisherwoman snapped angrily. This has just got to stop. What should I do? She's eaten, she is warm and dry, and still she cries and cries and cries. Maybe, the old fisherwoman sighed, you should find something for her to play with. At this, the baby, who was, of course, Raven, laughed happily and reached out her arms for the carved wooden box. Oh, no, baby, the daughter said quickly. You mustn't touch that. I first met Marianne because her natural mother, Betty Jane, was the best friend that I had in Nanaimo. We used to make jokes that if she got hit by a bus, I would look after her kids. If I got hit by a falling airplane, she would look after my kids. And totally unexpectedly, the year that she was 40, Betty Jane had a heart attack and was dead. And it was um, suddenly not a joke anymore. Marianne and I just, just became very good friends. She's my kid. She listens to the stories. She finds her own stories now. She's involved in theater, and, and she's not doing it because mommy wanted her to. 
true. She's doing it because she she wants to do it. She's very, very good at it. I became a feminist at the moment of birth. Pro no, actually, I became a feminist at the moment of conception. I wound up female. And if you are female and if you have a brain and if you will insist on using it, you can't help but be a feminist. I think I was around 11 years old and and it occurred to me that all of the stuff that I had really, really liked to read had to have been written by somebody. And that seemed like something, you know, original thought number one. Somebody wrote this. Somebody told this story. And, um, and there were stories where I didn't really like the ending. And I started rewriting other people's endings. And then I had a notebook. And I... I just, around 11, 11 and a half, started writing. And, and I have done it ever since. The baby, who was of course Raven, crawled over to the carved cedar box and carefully lifted the lid. Inside, a piece of soft water fur lay. Ooh. Tara is the baby in the family, and I think that she has an unbelievable talent. I looked at her work, got really, really excited, and inside of a very short period of time, I handed some stories to her, asked her to read them. She read them. She liked them. And then I asked her, would she do the illustrations for them? And these stories had been waiting for a long time for an illustrator. The first picture of hers that I saw that made me excited and happy and, and that grabbed me, the picture of the old woman, Tara was only 13 when she did that. Now, immediately, some of the anthropologists will ask, did I use the very exact choice of words? And the answer to that is no that very often the people who were telling me these stories didn't have the vocabulary in English that could convey the poetry and the beauty of that story in their own language. Why, why does it have to stay in broken English, in dialect, in restricted vocabulary? I could listen to them tell the story in Nootka, which I don't speak, but I could hear that there was a rhythm, there was a poetry, you could hear the, the waves, you could... You could see trees with the wind blowing through them. Caw, 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 mocked Raven. You can't catch me. Caw, caw, caw. And Raven put moon in her beak and flew up the smoke hole in the roof. Caw, caw, caw. Raven celebrated. It's mine, 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 all mine. Raven knew she would never make it over the mountains with moon in her beak. So, Raven tossed the moon up, up, up into the sky, as high as she could, and the moon caught on the corner of a cloud. Look, said the daughter, look up there in the sky. That's our moon, said the fisherwoman. We'll never get it back now, said the daughter. Ah, her mother smiled and shrugged. Look at it. Moon looks much better up there in the sky than it ever looked in that box. And to this day, Moon is where Raven put it. I think writing for theater was an accident. I had practically no, no knowledge of theater, no background in theater. I probably hadn't seen very much of anything except these dreadful, dreadful fifth-rate Shakespearean companies that wander around in the small towns of British Columbia putting on performances during which everybody sleeps, chews gum, tells dirty jokes, whatever. And, uh, and I was writing poetry. I was writing a lot of very angry poetry. And I was writing for a little newspaper in Vancouver called The Indian Voice. And... Rocky Amos and John Raymond, who were editors of the paper, took a number of these poems, put them together, and they worked. It was, uh, of course, as with most things, 
there, there had been no thought of mine involved in it. It was just an, an accident. And they entered it in the British Columbia Centennial Playwriting Competition special category. And uh, it took first prize. And for about three years, I wandered around saying, what happened, what happened? And I did, I think, four plays. And I really wish, I really wish they would take them out of these anthologies. I wish they would take them off and bury them somewhere. They're terrible. They're horrible. I didn't know what I was doing. As God is my witness, I apologize. It's ghastly. There are trees on the coast stripped of bark, stark silver white. And without the bark, one can see how the very wood is twisted so the dead tree seems to be like a corkscrew rooted in the earth. There are rocks on the coast which, like the trees, seem corkscrewed, seem to twist upon themselves as if in agony. Whirlpools and riptides are the same, only different, all because they have seen Sichel and tried to flee. Sichel moves freely in water, whether salt or fresh, even in heavy rain, for he is able to transform himself. He seeks those who cannot control their fear, who do not have a truth. Fearful he is and terrifying. His eyes send cold fire into your belly and his forked serpent tongue flashes horror at your soul. No words could explain Sichel, who looks like a snake but has no tail, rather a head at both ends, each head more fearsome than the other, and from him emanates cold and horror. If you break faith with what you know, if you try to flee, Sichel will blow with both mouths at once and you will begin to spin. Not rooted in the earth as are the trees and rocks, not eternal as are the tides and currents, your corkscrew spinning will cause you to leave the earth, to wander forever a lost soul and your voice will be heard in the screaming winds of first autumn, sobbing, pleading, begging for release. When you see Sichel the terrifying, though you be frightened, stand firm. First one head, then the other will rise from the water, closer, closer, coming for your face. Before the twin mouths of Sichel can fasten on your face and steal your soul, each head must turn towards you. When this happens, Sichel will see his own face. Who sees the other half of self sees truth. Sichel spends eternity in search of truth, in search of those who know truth. He will bless you with magic. He will go and your truth will be yours forever. Though at times it may be tested, even weakened, the magic of Sichel, his blessing is your truth will endure. And the sweet slalicum will visit you often, reminding you your truth will be found behind your own eyes. And you will not be alone again. <laughs>